with Superfly here. The subject is aerodynamics. There's been a little bit of uh, talk lately about uh, aerodynamics in the paraglider context, and we just want to share with you our version. Uh, quick disclaimer, there are lots of versions. Most good instructors will tell you there are lots of things to consider. Every concept in paragliding is usually a two-sided coin. Keep an open mind. Our version of aerodynamics is a little interesting, and we hope you enjoy it. Paragliders move fore and aft. Forgive the art. They swing back behind. They go back out in front. More than anything, they come back to equilibrium a lot. This, in our model, is called angle of attack. Angle of the canopy, angle of the wing relative to the airflow. There's also the concept of speed system. So, and what that does to the wing. Um, when you have the glider at trim, the glider is status quo. When you push some speed, legs out straight, then the glider is a different glider, basically. This is glider number one, this is glider number two, this is a fast one. Um, relationships have changed. The relationship between the pilot and or the horizon and the glider has changed. This change in the business is called angle of incidence. Angle of the wing relative to the pilot or the horizon. Why do we bring in this word angle of incidence? And the answer is because both of those things can't be angle of attack. There's also talk about the relationship between angle of attack and deflation and stall. Largely, the classic model of it largely comes from airplane logic and take a little bit of uh, exception to that and we'll speak about it in our own terms as it pertains to parallel. Um, number one, stall. Nice clean glider. Nice airflow over top and bottom. Bernoulli would love that. When the glider gets excessively deformed, especially on the trailing edge, and the pilot would have to have the arms down and all that sort of stuff, then we get stall. And that's the only thing that makes stall, is gross trailing edge deformation. Make it so that Bernoulli's magic can't happen, you get airflow separation, and no longer flying. What about change in angle of attack and stall? We know in the airplane context, angle of attack and stall are linked. It's well, it turns out that you can take a paraglider and you can make it surge out in front really far. You can hit the brakes and knock it really far back and there's no stall because the deformation you're causing it only lasts a second before you let back off and it goes back out in front, no stall. So there's not a link between angle of attack and stall in a paraglider. The other support for that is that you can take a glider, you can have it straight above head, and then pull a bunch of brake, and you'll still be here kind of status quo, not particularly having knees there, but now you do. Um, not particularly having the glider back behind your head, more accurately, the glider straight above head, and from straight above head, and the, you'll notice the front edge of the glider is not disturbed, it's status quo, the thing will stall and crumple behind you. So stall is only linked to great, gross trailing edge deformation. Are you guys buying it? The reason why we uh, go down this rabbit hole is because we seek better and greater clarity for our students. We know that if we just send you down the road with the classic model of aerodynamics, then you will have t questions over time. And we know that if we take the time to sell you on this idea, that the better understanding affects your outcomes. And you don't end up with these big conundrums down the road as you fly more. Now we're talking about deflation. So it is said, in, and especially in some recent video, that um, deflation is linked with angle of attack. You know, glider status quo, a glider maybe just a little bit out in front. Which one do you think they say is more prone to deflation? Out in front. Right, because they imagine that the wind is fairly constant, and here the relationships are fairly status quo, but then here, functionally, you know, you have this angle of attack change, and then the glider is more prone to a deflation about like so, it's how the model looks. 
again, it doesn't answer to the idea that the glider can surge way out in front and never deflate. It happens all the time when we do aerobatics. Um, if you're practicing dramatic pitch oscillations, it can go really far out in front, doesn't deflate. So this one is a little bit funky for us. If it's not angle of attack that causes deflation, then what are the variables when it comes to deflation? And so I'm going to argue that it's more a case of deflection being what keeps the paraglider open, meaning we generally have an airflow about like so. By the time you pull down the trailing edge a modest amount, then by function of this just being pulled down and the general air just hitting right here, this part can't deflate. And it's like basically the cornerstone of our entire teaching method and the whole cornerstone of our school. Um, so much so that right there on the wall, there's a big sign that says brakes prevent deflation. And we found it to be true in the air. And we think that if you ask just about anybody in the business, they will be able to tell you, you know, stories and anecdotes and um, decades long uh, history that will support that idea. Um, it's as simple as that. And if you're a new person then um, to paragliding and you're trying to wrap your head around it, the best way that we can explain it is you stick your hand out the window of the car while you're driving, or sorry, somebody else is driving, and uh, you put your hand at a critical angle, you get a lifting sensation, right? And then you also know that if you kind of um, bring your hand to an, a, a lower angle, then you get this downward pushing sensation. And to a certain point, you know, that you would imagine that that's what we're talking about. But then when you put your elbow out and your whole arm out like this, what you find is that you can move your hand way up high and way down low and all you ever feel here is a lifting sensation. So that's like aerodynamic, physical, tangible support as if, you know, 30 odd years of flying paragliders and pulling brakes to prevent inflations is not enough. That's physical and aerodynamic support for the idea that by pulling down on the back, you keep the front from ever deflating. And there's piles of support for this. What works better when you're kiting in turbulence? Let off the brakes and just let the thing fly or judicious addition and subtraction of brake. Duh. The better you are at adding and subtracting little brakes. Even if you're just pumping while you kite, it's very clear that that's going to work to prevent deflation a lot better than doing nothing. Uh, it's also true if you find yourself in the worst case scenario, you're landing behind a row of trees, and this is our classic anecdote. You get a room full of 100 plus skydivers, paragliders, paramotor pilots, and you say to the guys, the wind's cranking, you're going to land behind a row of trees. The glider's like this, you're coming in, and by most accounts, this air in here is like this. So the odds that you could take a deflation as you land in there are really high. What are you going to do? And so option one, is let it fly, keep the speed up. Airplane people know the only thing you can do is get too slow. There's not really such a problem as going too fast. Keep the speed up, speed your buddy, off you go. Everyone who believes that, raise your hand. You get 60%, something like that. Number two, um, add and subtract brake, as in judicious addition and subtraction of brake. Legs down, chest forward, working the brake as if to say glider, you're not deflating, not now, not on my watch, not here, not in this rotor. We're keeping this thing into the wind, we're keeping it open, and it's going to look like this. 40%. Guess what? 60% are wrong. If you think you should keep the speed up going in here, and that that's going to be of, of use to you, you're wrong. A judicious addition and subtraction of brake is the only answer. For sure we don't want you to stall it. Duh. But it turns out that the brake that you add and subtract to prevent deflations is in here. Meanwhile, the stall is down here. So it's not like the biggest risk. Brakes prevent deflation. We've proved it time and time again. We need to say it in so many words. And when we use um, these paradigms, paradigm number one was angle of attack is just the swinging around fore and aft. Call it what it is. Angle of incidence is when you push the speed bar. Neither of them are particularly linked to deflation. But what prevents deflation is adding a subtracting brake. Small caveat for the fact that when you push the glider full speed, then it's slightly more prone to deflation. Cool. So by the time you do that, you basically heard the Superfly aerodynamics chat. And 
Um, the main reason why we're putting it in video, the main reason why the sign in the wall says brakes prevent deflation. If I was going to get a tattoo, I would probably have to say that. Maybe I'll tattoo one of my kids with it. But it's like the most important thing. And somehow the logic is a tiny bit lost on people here and there, even though it's all we're doing all the time. And they start to think things like, you know, angle of attack is what uh, is linked to deflation. It's not the case. Um, they start to think things like angle of attack um, is both the pitching that happens fore and aft and the use of speed system that they both do angle of attack. It's wrong. It's, it's misguided. If you're of the, the classic mind and you don't want to buy in on this logic, that's okay. But the sell is that your outcomes will be better, your flying will be better, your understanding will be better. Um, it's just words, but it's all about words and they have it.